Okay, thanks. Welcome back once again. Uh, this is the last lesson in this four series lesson. Hebrews 6, Hebrews 7, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 9. We're going to wrap it up. We will ease into chapter 10 at the end of this. But let me give you a little bit of this sort of um, background on Hebrews. You've heard it before if you've been listening to these lessons, but if not, I want to give you the background. The book of Hebrews was written um, in the years 80, 50 to 80, 70, 50 to 70 years after Christ's death and resurrection. It is written for Christians who come from a Jewish background and they are living outside of Jerusalem. They do not live in Jerusalem, but they are discouraged because they're being persecuted. Christ has been gone. They're losing hope. Their entire history and certainly most of their family members are Jewish. And there are many sects being spun off where they are teaching Christ, but in ways that are only half true. So these Christians are being persecuted throughout the Roman Empire from Rome to Jerusalem. So remaining Jewish and practicing sort of a hybrid Judaism or excuse me, a hybrid Christian Jewish life might protect them from death. Judaism, the religion of their birth, was not a second rate religion. It is not a second rate religion. It was divinely designed, expressing true devotion and worship to God, and it was familiar and convenient to them. Many of those who accepted Christ longed for familiar routines and ceremonies and, and the rituals that go with it and the promises uh, that were described by God's prophets. This is something they've lived with and that they long for because it's, fam it's very familiar. Today, we as Christians can draw upon that in the sense that while they were discouraged, in their world, they were persecuted. We too are sometimes discouraged because we live in a world where it's commonplace to look at, at Christians and be vilified, uh, either because there are Christians who frankly deserve to be because they act, behave badly or because th there are people who are atheists or agnostics or just so um, so out there. What, I don't know the right term I'm looking for, but they just vilify Christians. We are they think of us as angry, narrow-minded, disputatious, argumentative people instead of the people who love God and love them. And so we might, if we were not strong in our faith, we might become weak-hearted and fall into doubt and despair and become anxious and fearful. And we shouldn't be that way. We should be strong and steadfast in our faith. The book of Hebrews tells us that. The gist of the book of Hebrews is this. Jesus is better than everything else. Jesus is supreme and completely sufficient for your salvation. You don't need anything else or anyone else. He is the perfect revelation and reflection of God. He is a complete sacrifice for our sins. He is compassionate, understanding, a mediator, an intercessor, and he is the only way to eternal life. So if you put that in one sentence, it's this. Christ is my only security in a changing world, and the world is ever-changing. So that's Hebrews in a nutshell. Okay, so you don't even have to go, don't even open your Bible. Just accept that as it, as it is. All right, last week, sorry, I have to sniff. Last week I asked you this. Do you have any rules you live by? And the answer was yes. And I told you some of my rules. And I told you there's a new rule that the book of Hebrews taught me. And I'm going to share with that with you today. I promise you, I left you hanging at the end of the last lesson. I didn't tell you the new rule, but, but I'll tell you the old rules and then we'll get to the new one. Old rules, love God, love people. Pretty simple. The second rule, assume best intentions of other people. If you want to know what I mean by that, go watch the other lesson. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Assume that everyone has a bad day. If they say something, they do something, and you happen to have been put off by it, assume the best in them and give them the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps they just had something tragic happen, and if you knew that, you would shift and all of a sudden become more compassionate toward them. Um, give people a second chance. People are going to do things. They're going to make mistakes. Mistakes, all of us make mistakes. Sometimes we even say and do things that we wish we could take back, but it, 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 we just don't believe that we would be forgiven. So give people a second chance and hope others will give you a second chance. And give people a graceful exit whenever you can. If they do something wrong, if they make a bonehead mistake, whatever it is, if you can show compassion to them and give them a graceful exit so that they are able to save face and they're not... Um, they're not made the bad guy. Give Do that if you can. There's no reason not to, and it shows love and compassion. All right, so far, as we've studied this, we've learned that Jesus is a high priest appointed by God in the order of Melchizedek, and he meets all the criteria God established. That is, he is one who is holy, blameless, pure, 
set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. We also learned that Jesus doesn't make sacrifices for his own sins because he never sinned. Furthermore, our author, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews, said to us, Now the main point is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven to intercede on our behalf before God. What a beautiful thing that is. In late in our last session, we learned the reason that Jesus has become that heavenly high priest was because there's something wrong with the first covenant. For in verse uh, chapter 8, verse 7 states it this way. If there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. So had, there, had the first covenant been fulfilled, we would not even need a second covenant. The problem was not with the covenant itself, but with the people. They couldn't live up it to their end of the bargain. They couldn't follow the law. They couldn't be obedient. They couldn't love God. They couldn't even follow the first commandment to have no other gods. And in that last session, I asked you to pretend that you are, in fact, one of the first century Christians living in that life outside Jerusalem, being persecuted by the Romans. I want you to do that again. Pretend with me that we're going back where we were. You had questions to ask of the author, and so we want to go back to those questions. Here's the question that, that we left with that, that I wanted to ask as that first, first century Christian. So, Mr. Author, you know everything. Why all these laws and sacrifices all these years, for 2,000 years, and how exactly does it that Christ changes that at all? So the author, in his patience with us as people who have sort of quit trying to understand, he says, why don't we read something here? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. The Holy Spirit was showing, showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifice being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Hmm. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the end, excuse me, until the time of the new order. So our author has said something to us here. We're still sort of, he can see we're looking crawl like, what? You know, he can see our facial expression. And he says, there's more. There's more to this. Keep reading. I think you'll understand Christ in this if you just keep reading. So we're in chapter 9, verses 11 to 14, it continues. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not part of this creation, which goes back to our earlier discussion about is there a tabernacle in heaven? And Moses created a tabernacle here. There's a copy of the one in heaven. This seems to validate our belief, which is that the tabernacle is there is not a part of this creation. Continuing verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctified them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And then when you jump to verse 15, it finishes like this. For this reason, he has died as a ransom to set them free from their sins committed under the first covenant. So, hmm, the author now looks at you and says, okay, Christian, do you see the difference now? The acts that lead to death is sin. Pretty straightforward. Sin leads to death. And Jesus died so that our sins are forgiven. But there's more. And I don't want you to miss this part. He says to us, look at the last part of, of that last verse we just read. Don't miss this. We are cleansed of sin for a reason, so that we may serve the living God. If you just skip over all this, you all read all this, you're thinking, oh, great, Jesus, high priest, order Melchizedek, died of our sin, for our sins, we're saved, we're, we're saved. Yay, go into eternal. There's more to it. We are saved for a reason, and that is so that we may serve the living God. So the author has said all this to us, and of course, we have more questions. Okay, I get it, but I have one more question. The author, ask as many questions as you need. I get that he died. 
I get that my old sins are forgiven, but what about new sins that I commit today or sins I commit tomorrow? The old priest, the old high priest, remember the Jewish high priest? He would go back into the tabernacle and seek forgiveness for those. What do I do now if I sin later today or tomorrow? Mm. Author, he might refer us back to the section in chapter five that said, you're not even trying to understand, but he yeah. doesn't. He's very patient with us and says, why don't we try this? Let's read chapter nine, verses 18 to 22. Perhaps that will give insight. Mm -hmm. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool and branches of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll in the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way he sprinkled the, with blood both the tabernacle and everything used in it in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And then he says, keep reading. There's more here. Chapter 9, verses 23 to 28. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For, get that meaning? Uh -huh. The things here on earth that were a copy needed to be sprinkled with blood to be, to be cleansed. The heavenly things themselves needed better sacrifices to be cleansed, to be prepared, maybe is a better word. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that, that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. And here's the catcher. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the age to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Mm -hmm. So the sacrifice of goats and calves and those things and that sprinkling of the blood here on earth was inferior to the blood of Christ himself that was sacrificed and, in my opinion, sprinkled on the tabernacle in heaven in order that eternity is there for all of us. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Our, our author think, knows we're thick, right? He mm -hmm. says, so let me complete the thought. Don't stop there. Go on into chapter 10. There are no chapters in the letter, yeah. right? Go on into chapter 10. And the first verse of chapter 10 may help to explain this and sort of draw it in. This is... Um, this is verses 1 through 4 of chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who are drawn near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed, cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices were an annual reminder of their sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So I want to pause before moving on, for wrapping this up, because we're going to yeah. end in just a moment. Let me pause here. Verse 1 describes the law as only a shadow of the good things. What the heck does that mean? Uh -huh. What is the law, and how can it be a shadow of good things? I thought the law was these rigid rules and boundaries and guidelines, and I thought that was what the law is. How can it be a shadow of good things? That makes no sense. Uh -huh. And maybe it doesn't. If you think of the Bible as a set of arbitrary rules that some God put in front of you and said, follow these rules. Those are the rules. I made them up. You have to follow them. If it's arbitrary, it's like if you give me a rule and tell me to follow, I'm going to go, you know, first off, why? Yeah. What? Give me some sense of that. And if I don't like what you said, and it makes no sense. I'm going to say, I ain't following your rule. It makes no sense. Why would I follow a stupid rule? And so if you think of the law as rules and boundaries, then perhaps you're looking at the law in the wrong way. And that's why you can't see it like this scripture speaks of it as the shadow of good things. Let me read you to it from Proverbs and Psalm and give you a better or different sense. Because the Jewish people do not think of the law the way most Christians do. The Jewish people think of the law as the teachings. It is the things you can learn. It is the way to know God. 
It is a hunger they have, and they reread the Torah cover to cover every year. And when they finish, you know what they do? They roll it up all the way back, and they start over again. And they first, before they start reading again, chapter 1, verse 1, they take the Torah, and they dance around the tabernacle with it in the dance of joy. I mean, we should read the Bible from end to end and then pick it up and dance around our house in the dance of joy, but we, we're typically not that. Um, we don't. Anyway, so here's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 13, 14 says, The teaching, which is the Torah, the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life. Proverbs 31, 26 says, Speak with wisdom and faithful instruction. Faithful instruction is the Torah. Psalm 1-2 says this, and this is the Jewish translation of Psalm 1-2. The teaching of the Lord is his delight, and he studies the teaching day and night. So our perception of what the law is, if we think of it differently, all of a sudden that verse comes alive that the law is a shadow of the good teachings. Or the teachings, these are only a shadow of the better teachings that are to come. So that's the way we should be envisioning what the especially the Torah of God, the first five verses of the Bible are about. Verse 3 says this. Um, in fact, it explains why the sacrifices are required. Because remember, we asked the question of our author, why all these sacrifices year after year after year after year? Pretty clear here. He says, this is simple. These sacrifices are an annual reminder of your sin. The sacrifices made annually are to remind you that you are human and frail and a failure. And so... Could you imagine if you're a, a Jew and every single year you're reminded of the guilt of your sin? What joy it is to be a Christian who knows that Christ has died once and for all for us. Um, in fact, what is Easter to us? It's, it's like Yom Kippur for the Jew. They have an annual reminder of their sin and they have an atonement but not a forgiveness. Easter is an annual reminder of my sin and the sheer joy and humility of knowing that Jesus died for me and that my sins are forgiven. So we annually have a reminder that we are sinners and we are forgiven. Let's wrap this up. Okay. Wrapping up chapter 9 by reading chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 10 to 14. This says it like this. And by that, uh, excuse me, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he then sat down at the right hand of God. Whew, gives me chills. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Who's that? Hmm. So as a first century Christian, what's, what's your reaction to all that we've studied here about Old Testament sacrifices, a New Testament covenant, there's no more need for repeated sacrifices, your sins past, present, and future are forgiven once and for all, and the sacrifice, singular, not plural, the sacrifice of Christ that was made for you. What's it make you feel? I sit here thinking... As a first century Christian or a 2021 20, Christian, I feel the same thing, which is amazed and joyful, thankful, grateful, and humbled by what Christ has done. It's a phenomenal thing because in the, I think it's Romans, it says, I, I, basically, I died for you while we were still enemies. Yeah. It's hard for me to believe that someone would die for me while I still hated him. And yet we, that's, that's the, you know, before we loved Christ, we, the all, the, we were the opposite. We were his enemies. Okay, summary. I mentioned that there was a new rule for life. I told you my other rules. I got a new rule. My new rule is this. Be grateful. Don't take for granted the joy and the blessings and the life that I have because it comes at a great sacrifice and not my own. Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection is that sacrifice that gives me this life not this little life I have here on earth, though it is pleasant and I'm joyful and thankful and grateful and all that. It's the eternal life that's to come that is that good blessing of the future. I'm going to close with this, two things. First, Jesus is the Son of God, the high priest, eternal, our source of eternal salvation. Jesus is eternally interceding for you and for me. 
I am to be a mature Christian, not one easily swayed by fear, anxiety, or the arguments of men. I am to stand firm as I have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And finally, in the words of John Piper, the Bible is not written as a self-help book or as a guide to our mental health. Though you may get help from it, the Bible was written to explain to us about the massive holiness of God. God's cool. It's awesome. The end. <laughs>